Good evening. My name is Kathy Thompson. I'm Assistant Superintendent for Teaching and Learning for Seattle Schools. I'm sorry we have an echo. Um, as any of you who went to the meeting at Schmitz Park know, there were somewhere between 350 and 400 people at that meeting, which we had not anticipated. And what I heard, I was at the meeting, so what I heard is that there were actually people standing in the hallways and outside. And so first I want to apologize for that. We truly um, didn't anticipate the interest. On the other hand, we're thrilled by the interest. So tonight we set up for all the people. But of course, there were people got what they needed, some of them at the last meeting. We responded to about 100 emails in the last couple of weeks. We have FAQs up on the website as of today. And I've also had many phone calls with people. So hopefully we got some information out that way as well. So thank you for being here and welcome. We are so excited to talk about this new K-5 STEM that's coming up at Warren. The other people who are here with me tonight are Aurora Laura, who is the Regional Director for West Seattle, so she will supervise the new school, and Kim Van Adam, who is our Project Manager for this project, pending the principal's arrival, and her first actual day of work is April 9th, and then Kim will transition, um, the principal won't know our system, et cetera, so Kim will be able to help her get to know the system and let her know all the work that she's done since then. So with that, um, we do have more answers than we had a few weeks ago, but you still will not get every answer because so much relies on what the design team's decision is. I want you to know the last day for turning in design team applications is tomorrow. We have quite a few applications, I think, Kim, is that correct? Last. Um, we have two parents, and Kim and I and Aurora will be screening the applications. We have a rubric to do that. We'll be selecting the design team next week. People will be notified, and then the first design team meeting is the very next week. So we're not waiting for the principal to get here to start the work. We'll start um, at least getting people prepped and trained about what it is to be a design team. We're in touch with the principal almost on a daily basis. We're thinking still running a school in Arizona at the same time, but she's pretty excited, and I get a text. It's two, what, an hour or two hours ahead, and so I get a text about 5 a.m. our time where she's asking me this long list of questions. And then I know she's doing her principal thing, so I have the day to get back to her by email. But the next morning, I've got a long list of questions again. So she's already pretty engaged in the idea and pretty excited about it. Yes, ma'am. How big will the design team be? How many people? Um, we're going to have, thank you for asking, 15 people on the design team. Um, the way we've set it up, it will be six parents, six staff members, and three community members who um, may not be parents, but may be an organization that has a vested interest. For example, Boeing might choose to apply. I don't know who's applied, I haven't seen it. So, and we can talk more about that as well. Um, we're expecting a few more staff members. Do we have interpreters here tonight? I apologize, I was expecting interpreters tonight, so either they're still coming or um, somehow there was a miscommunication. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to Aurora Laura. She'll take you through the slideshow. She has a six-minute video of what a strong elementary STEM looks like. It's from the Midwest, I believe. And then after that, we'll just have a conversation and answer as many questions as we can. Thank you. 
further. You know, I think there are a lot of reasons. Basically, it's just going to take a really strong foundation in math, science, and technology. And these are skills that no matter what they choose to do with the rest of their lives, these are skills that will be really important to them. Um, also, it's just going to take the skills necessary to be successful in middle school, high school, college, and careers, and just give them exposure to new career options that they might not normally otherwise consider. So, the K-5 STEM School at Warren is going to be open to any student in the Seattle Public Schools um, in grade K-5 for next year. Transportation is only going to be provided to West Seattle families, though, if you live in the um, outside of the zone. And in order to get in, you just need to apply by filling out an open enrollment form, which is avail was available starting February 27th. And um, families, even if you choose not to do it during open enrollment, if there's still space, you can enroll all the way up to September 30th. So I know some of you, um, we've gotten a lot of emails and comments that we just don't have a lot of information out right now, which is true. Um, so we took days to wait. Um, we're going to go meet and greet on March 13th, so you can wait to meet the principal. Um, we're going to keep giving updates and keep you updated around the design team work. So just know that as long as space is available, you can make a decision later. Yes? The meet and greet is March 13th at 6.30 p.m. at Madison. We have flyers that you can pick up at the end just to remind yourself. We're also going to do a meet and greet later on in the um, spring to meet all the new teachers who will be there. So we do have a new principal that's been selected for the STEM school. Her name is Shannon McKinney, and she is um, currently a principal in Arizona. She will be out here to find a place to live, and we're going to do a meet and greet on March 13th. And then she officially starts in the district on April 9th. So once she gets in the district, she will begin leading the design team work. But we are just getting started and making some decisions in the meantime. Um, and we'll just welcome her when she is able to join us. I also want to introduce Kim Van Adams, who you saw earlier. She is going to be organizing and leading the design team until Dr. McKinney starts in Seattle. So she'll be here tonight, and we'll be also available for the question and answer. She's also taking notes about all the questions you ask, so we can put them on the frequently asked questions page. So, the design team that Kai mentioned, um, applications are out and are due tomorrow. We've got quite a few applications that have already come in. It is going to have 15 people on it. Um, there will be parents, teachers, possibly students, community members, business partners. We'll see what kind of applications come in. There's going to be a, design, a, a little steering committee that meets next week to review all those applications. And we're going to select the people who will end up on that committee and notify them by next Friday, March 9th. And um, then the first design team meeting, I believe it's going to be on March 14th at 6 p.m. Um, and those design team meetings, even if you don't end up on the design team, the meetings themselves are open to the public. So you can still come and listen in and just see where things are going. The design team um, made up of all those people. That's the group that will make decisions about the vision and mission, curriculum, program features. So the exciting thing about being part of this new school is just having the opportunity to give your input to help build what this school is going to look like and for us to be able to work with you and engage you in this process. So it's just a great opportunity to actually shape the vision for our school. So if you are interested in being part of that committee, um, and again, the application is due tomorrow, March 2nd. Um, it is going to be a big time commitment, so the committee will probably meet two to four times a month for at least two hours each meeting, because it's a lot of work um, to start up a new school, but I think it will be really enriching for the people who are able to be part of that. And, and like I said, even if you can't give up all that time to be part of it, you're still welcome to come to the meetings. Um, So the frequently asked questions that are asked are going to be posted regularly on our K-5 STEM website. We've got the first round of questions answers up today, and I think every Friday we're going to post new ones as the information comes in. There will be an online survey later on this spring for what we have around this to give us more feedback about what you'd like to see at the new school. Like I mentioned earlier, we're going to have the meet greet on March 13th with Dr. McKinney. And this spring, uh, after hiring has been done, we'll do um, some kind of meet and greet and an opportunity to see the foreign site 
and for you to meet the teachers and find out more about what their envisioning staff will look like for your first students. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy Thompson to do questioning and answer. STEM to life in a hands-on learning environment where students explore the world around them and apply learning strategies to everyday problems. We truly are a building of thinkers and problem solvers. Teaching students there is more than one way to find the correct answer. Today I would like to highlight just a few of our STEM initiatives and practices. Let's begin with science. Our science program is based on Minnesota state standards. However, at Cedar Park, we are able to expand and enrich the scientific learning experience for students. We have two full-time science specialists on staff who work with our teachers and students. These in-house experts collaborate with our classroom teachers, assist with professional development, build community partnerships, and support our teachers with writing advanced scientific curriculum for students. Most importantly, our students have access to science labs and outdoor learning spaces where they can put their scientific learning theories to practice. Our technology is state-of-the-art. Each classroom at Cedar Park is considered an interactive learning space with smart boards, document cameras, and surround sound teacher mic audio. We have two computer labs and offer a one-to-one -one laptop program in fifth grade where each student has their own laptop for the year. In addition to our one-to-one -one program, we have two mobile laptop cards that rotate throughout the building for additional use in grades kindergarten through fourth. The staff spends countless hours in professional development during the school year to ensure outstanding technology instruction. The kids just think it's cool. Engineering. Engineering is a relatively new concept in elementary school. The state has recently added engineering standards for elementary students. We have a dedicated engineering specialist on staff who helps our teachers incorporate engineering concepts that are readily understandable to students. We tell students that engineering is all around us, and if we look close enough, we can see it. Our students learn that engineering is more of a process than a product. The engineering products we use are born from the process. Mathematics at Cedar Park is closely aligned with that of the district. We have a math specialist on staff who helps us differentiate instruction for all students. For example, we know that all students are not at grade level and sometimes struggle with math. For these students, we offer a supportive math program called AVMR. We also try to challenge those students at grade level with our investigations curriculum. For those students who have a high math ability in grades 3 through 5, we have Project M cubed. We can also support all of our high math ability students through our gifted and talented and young scholars program. 
These are only a few of our STEM initiatives and practices. We are an incredibly well-resourced building with dedicated STEM teachers. Our students are continuously exposed to the richest curriculum and tools for learning. We strive to create lifelong learners and encourage our students to challenge one another and themselves. We as staff challenge each other every single day to bring our best possible instruction to students. We look forward to sharing our journey with you and hope you'll pay us a visit soon. Um, 
in enrollment. There are questions about how big will this school be? And I have to tell you that two weeks ago, we were thinking, well, what's the smallest it can be? And we, and we can still pull this off. And now we're going, oh, how big can it be? And we can still um, uh, accommodate. So the board building has three large wings. It was built as a middle school. I actually, many years ago, in 1990, taught preschool in that building for the West Seattle Co-ops. Um, so I'm pretty familiar with it. The, um, the, the three wings open off of the parking lot on the south end is where the office is, and then the gym and the lunchroom are right down there. The first wing will house most of the classrooms, and there are, uh, there's an open space between each. It's, it's built like across the top is a long hallway, and then there's three separate wings that go down. The middle wing is where most likely the computer lab and the science rooms will be. The nice thing about it being in the schools, there's already science rooms there. They'll only need to be first. We'll have furniture that adjusts to the height of the little ones. And actually, there'll be new or new refurbished furniture in the building, not anything that's been there forever. Um, there's questions about things like the restrooms, and then we're in the middle school. We're very aware that kindergartners um, don't need to climb up onto the facility. So, what they're looking at doing is either they're building platforms for the children or figuring out whatever they need to figure out. So, I assure you, we're very aware that this needs to be sized appropriately. There will be a pre-K program, a special education pre-K program on site, and there will also be a special education transitional kindergarten on site. So the both of those programs will require even smaller facilities than um, our least for the pre-K and our K-5 students would need. We've even talked about the idea of two science labs, one for primary and one for intermediate, so kindergarten through second and third through fifth so that the furniture and the spaces are set up appropriately for the kids. I can't promise on that one, but it was the conversation that we had in the last couple of days with the facilities. Um, so, you see, and then we'll write it down. And, and Tracy said, don't give, don't give actual numbers, but our best thinking at this time is that we would have, if, if we asked, we would have two classrooms in grades one through five, but would go to three classrooms in kindergarten because that's where we're currently getting the most interest. And that makes sense, right? You can start at a new program. Now, I'm just saying that's our best thinking at that time. It will be restricted to the two wings that we are in a plan to refurbish. The third wing wasn't going to be refurbished until the next year. And there's an issue about getting permits from the city, et cetera. So it's not like we just say, Tons of interest is awesome, let's do the third wing too. So we do have STEM restrictions on size. Another question about enrollment is will there be any mixed grade classrooms? Um, there might be. It depends on who enrolls. If we end up with um, four fourth graders and ten fifth graders, I mean, that's just about top of my head, we would probably have a four or five classroom, for example. The nice thing, though, about a STEM program or looking at a project in the model is that it lends itself beautifully to mixed grade and mixed age classrooms. There are some schools that actually do that as an instructional approach as well. Um, so it's not split classes, they're actually doing mixed age. So we can't say exactly what those classrooms will look like at this time. Uh, Wendy Glenn, our uh, Director of Instructional Services, just came in. So Wendy oversees content, um, math, science, et cetera, and I'm glad she's here. She is part of the conversation around this program. We already talked about the design team. There are questions about special services at the school. Students who qualify for staff or APP, as well as students who qualify for special needs in terms of special education. Um, we will not have an APP or spectrum program at the site at this time. The school could choose to apply to be an advanced learning opportunity site, an ALO site, in which case teachers are trained on how to carefully differentiate and students actually see instruction at a, a higher, more advanced level, and then they're rated um, in that way. That would be the design team's choice. In terms of special education, if the child is a child who would be in any neighborhood school, not in a self-contained school, but receiving resource services in a neighborhood school, they would receive those same services at the school. There are lots of questions about pathways. What happens in middle and high school? And you know the answer to this one. Well, we're not sure yet. 
there are a lot of conversations right now, or at least they're beginning, and Aurora is leading those conversations about what might it look like here in Seattle, and there's interest on um, the secondary level. Um, so I'm excited about that too. I personally went to Jefferson Elementary, which is now Jefferson Square. I do have a lot of desks in my garage still. And then to Madison. It was nice when they rebuilt because they got really drapes and had been there since I was there. And then to West Seattle. My own children went to Alpine, Madison, and then they, they went to Franklin. They, they left across my dad and my daughter said we knew too many people in West Seattle and she had to get over the bridge to go to high school. So I just followed her back to the people there. But the reason I say that is because it's so exciting to have personal investment, personal interest, and see the path that we built out right here in my region. I've lived here since I was seven years old, and I'm deeply committed um, at my husband in high school. So, you know, some of us who just are here and stay here, wants to get to happen in our community. And that's how I feel about this. Now, if it was in another community, I'd be working very hard there, too. But this feels very personal in so many ways. There are questions about um, whether or not there will be a playground that I work on. Absolutely. There will actually be two playgrounds, as I hear it now. There will be one for the pre-K and the transitional K, a small size, and then there will be a regular playground. The question right now is exactly where are we located. As you know, we may not have our portals on the site. And it's, do we move the portals? Do we not move the portals in case this becomes a secondary school years down the road? And so where does it go? So I'm going to promise you there will be playgrounds. They will be fenced in completely because there are questions about security. The building will be a closed campus, meaning the only door that is unlocked will be the door by the office, is generally what that means. And we'll have a completely fenced off playing area for the children. And of course, we need to leave children unsupervised when they're outside. And that's a standard for any, any uh, school they have in the district. <laughs> Um, questions about funding, I think I already responded to that, that the money comes out of capital, which is a different pot of money, and we couldn't use any other way anyway. Questions about business partners. I went to a meeting at our new high school skills center, which we're working on, we several programs, including an aerospace program. And I was at a meeting at the King County Airport with Boeing, and five different local businesses approached me when they heard about the game by STEM, and said, what can we do, how can we be involved in getting their cars? I was blown away, and I'm very excited. And the next day, Disney called, I didn't talk to them, my secretary did, and said, we sponsor elementary school schools across the nation, and we want to be involved, and let us know what we can do. Now, right now, I don't know what to tell them about what they can do. I need to learn what they're doing already, but I am very interested in partnering with Disney, and I promise that does not mean you can I'm excited to hear what they have to say and what that means to them, what partner means to them. They certainly have a big account that's different with ours. <laughs> hiring. Kim, do you want to talk a little bit about the hiring that's coming on? Okay, you want, you want to do it? Yeah. So the one thing I can tell you is the teachers, these teaching positions for the new chaos STEM will be posted one to two weeks before all other teaching positions in the system. And that is so that we can have, they're posted in meaning only Seattle teachers can apply to get a fast contractual. But it also means that we get the first hit for this new school. And then if it's not filled, she'll tell you the rest. So yes, there were questions about um, the recruitment of teachers, and that generally will be filled within Seattle Public Schools. Teachers have already expressed interest. Um, in coming to STEM, working in a STEM school. The teachers will all be highly qualified in elementary education, be looking for endorsements in science and mathematics, they need to be highly qualified in those areas. Uh, if we are not able to fill the positions within our four Seattle public schools, then we will reach out to um, and extend recruitment for that. Is, oh, there was a question about special certification being required. It's not required. Um, they're all cert all of our teachers in Seattle Public Schools are certified through the state of Washington, and so there's not a special certification that would be required. There is a STEM certification, I understand, for teachers, but it wouldn't be required here in this school. Thank you. Which doesn't need to go on the road. So things to think about. Those are the big questions that have come up for us where we see these and patterns in the 
questions you have. What I want you to do now is just invite people to raise their hand. When you ask the question, I'll repeat it, and then we'll answer if we can. If we can't, we'll write it down, and we'll make sure it gets posted to the FAQ since we have an answer. Yes, sir. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Fernando, and I'm a father of two kindergarten and a second grader. And um, my question, I have a couple of questions actually. Like, uh, what would be the local impact of kids withdrawing from their schools? Um, um, also, um, what if one of my kids do not keep up with, you know, the, the, the kids that are on the STEM program? I mean, and uh, what assistance will parents get for homework? I mean, like, what about if I can understand the homework? <laughs> <laughs> and I can help my kid with homework. Okay, you're the first one was, what will it be as other low elementary if the kids are pulled out? I'm going to turn that over to Tracy, and then I'll talk about the homework problem now. Thank you. So we do have school choice in Seattle in addition to doing guaranteed assignments based on geography. So when families do choose to leave school, it'll depend how many. You know, two children per grade at one particular school, it, it won't have an impact with that school. If it's more children coming from one school, then I think obviously it would impact the, um, the enrollment at that school. The other two questions are on what happens if a child can't keep up. So a reminder that this program is not necessarily an accelerated program. There may be instances for accelerating, but it will also be about taking kids more deeply into the content and giving them different ways of learning it than the traditional ways that we have in, in many of our schools. We want every single classroom to have to differentiate in instruction, meaning you're teaching at the level that the child is, and every classroom has a huge range, and that will be a dominant focus at the new K-5 STEM. A homework help for parents question I didn't think of before. Um, it, it seems to me that um, it's a good question to ask the design team. I mean, this is a brand new model, so maybe there's a weekly evening, this is off the top of my head, where families come in with their kids in the homework and say, I'm not familiar with this approach. Frankly, when my daughter got in high school math, I was in big trouble, let me tell you. And I was good at math in high school, but it's being taught, as you know, in different ways. So thank you. Also, in terms of child really struggling, we'll have interventions available, just like we do in a general education school now. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Mark Colby. I have a son, a kindergartner at Santa's Club. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I wish you had had this meeting in the board school. Um, mm -hmm. I live a block from it. And it's a wreck. It's mm -hmm. really, it's, it's a really depressing building. It has lots of graffiti on it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of portables, more than 12, I, I think. 11. Yeah, and uh, so it doesn't look too welcoming to, uh, to new kids. I, I, think, I think people would be terrified if they walked around it right now. So I'm wondering how long uh, kids will stay and how long it's going to be in that facility and where it will go. So questions that I can't answer all of. So the question was, why was this meeting not in the board building, which I can respond to. And then comments that the building is, it doesn't look good. It's not very welcoming. It's a wreck is, is the actual word you used. And how will kids be there? The meeting could not be in that building because it's a closed building. If you go by it, the windows are boarded over, which is actually to protect them. We are not happy about the remedial. It's my understanding it should be removed. We were hoping today, actually. Um, which is also the standard policy in South schools. The remedial is removed immediately. Um, the refurbishment that's going on will be refurbishment. Um, we've asked for Wi-Fi throughout the building. There are tiles that will be replaced. They, everything will be repainted. It will be new or really refurbished furniture, etc. It's my understanding that the school will be remaining there for a minimum of two years, hence not a complete rebuilding of the site. And then we move to whichever building makes the most sense in the West Seattle area based on how many kids are in the school and what comes available. So many of our currently empty, uh, well, empty to us, we don't have schools in the sites, are actually um, being leased, which is a good business move for us. And so we also have to see the length of the lease before we can move one of our own schools in there. So I can't answer um, exactly how long it'll be there, and I'm sorry for that. Um, we do plan in May 
to bring families into the site. By then, some of the work will be going on. We figure we'll do a meet and greet right there. I acknowledge the building is what it is, and we'll do everything we can to make it as clean and cheerful and welcoming as it can be. And so much of that also comes from the feeling in the building, as well as the what the exterior looks like. I was a principal of a very dilapidated elementary in Southeast Seattle for four years. And I'll tell you, when you pull out, you went around, when you went in, the feeling tone kind of took over, and that's what's most important. But we take seriously the condition of the building. Should have facilities here tonight. Sorry. Yes. So you mentioned that the capital expense on getting it started. What's the safety net? So when we get it started, then what? Then does it fall into the operational expenses where we're upside down? No. So what happens, the reason there's a capital is because there's so much that has to go into opening it. We have to get the building ready. When it moves into whatever building it moves into, finally, that would be capital to get that facility ready as well. We use capital to put in the technology and buy the materials, et cetera. Then it moves into the regular funding stream of the district. So we get it dollars per student. And once we're established, we won't have all the facilities work and we won't need to buy all the curriculum and add the technology. It falls into that regular funding stream. So I'm not sure what you meant by it turns upside down. It would be funded in like every other elementary in the district. Well, my understanding that the Seattle school system is having serious financial Absolutely, we all are. Um, you're right. We, three years in a row, had a significant decrease in our uh, budget, in our revenue. And we're projecting another decrease this year, smaller than past years. And at this point, it's got much less impact on what goes into schools. Eventually, the economy is going to turn around. However, just like all the other schools are run and they get X number of dollars per student, so will this STEM school. It will be one of our Seattle schools and it will be funded the same way. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. The question is, should the video talks about um, science or engineering specialists in the school and will there be resources? The way it will be staffed right now is that there will be X number of a teacher for every um, 26 or 20 students, which is our um, capacity or our contract. And then there is what we call a PCP teacher, or a planning, planning conference and preparation teacher. In a lot of schools, that's the PE teacher. So this, the teacher has 30 minutes or an hour of school and gives you their schedule per day. And the children go off to get into the content area. The school could choose to have a science specialist that the kids go to for that. The other thing is that there's so much community interest that if a community volunteer ever had one person who says, don't have kids, just one-on-one, two. Where do I sign up? It's like, woo! <laughs> very cool. I'm very, very detailed. So it could be that local businesses will would want to send someone out to do um, some sessions, which also occur with a teacher present and is planned with the teacher. Um, sometimes when we get business people, they aren't as familiar with how to teach kindergartners, for example. So the teacher helps support that, but the person brings the content expert. So again, the design team will decide exactly what is provided in terms of specialists. If there's lots of kids, there'll be more than one. Um, he's a PE teacher allocated, and therefore there could be more specialties on campus. PE is a required subject area for children in first through fifth grade. They're required to have 100 minutes per week. And so PE has to happen, but it doesn't have to happen with a specialist. It could happen with the classroom teacher. And all of us who learn to teach elementary school took a PE class, so we know how to teach it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good question. So the question was if the business wants to support the school directly. So anything that um, goes to a school is the property of the district overall. However, if you're a business and you want to buy a, a piece of equipment or give you money directly to, they absolutely can. So right now we have many PTSAs that actually fund teachers. And it goes into a self-help fund, which is and is considered essentially a grant, and then they pay for the teacher or the equipment or the materials that way. So yes, 
if it's a piece of equipment and the school were to close at some point, then that equipment becomes the property of Seattle schools overall. That nobody would walk in and say, hmm, I think we'll move that over here. Wouldn't happen. Thank you. Yes. Well, is there any criteria for enrollment? I could do have a application Tracy's question. The question is, is there a criteria for enrollment? And what happens if there's no applications and we have capacity? There are no specific requirements in terms of test scores or any kind of entrance requirements. If there are more children who apply, then we can accommodate. Just like other schools, we have what we call tiebreakers. So all the applications, I'm sure many of you know now, is the open enrollment period, which ends Friday, March the 9th. All the applications that we get for all the schools go into the computer, and then there's rules in the computer, and the, the rules for this year is basically going to be lottery. Siblings is always the first tiebreaker, but there's nobody in the school now, so there's no children coming in who already have a sibling in the school. Uh, in the future, the option schools typically have what we call a geographic priority zone. We have established that at this point for, uh, for this program. And did I hear it all? Okay, if it's an enrollment, go ahead and ask what she's at. So, I, I, how does it work with, with multiple option schools? So there's Pathfinder and there's this one, and if we want to, you know, put on our school choice form, both of them, how does the system work? You can list multiple schools. Your child starts out with an automatic assignment to their attendance area school, if you're talking about an incoming kindergartner, and then you can list multiple choices, and what the computer does, the computer doesn't look at subsequent choices. First, it looks at your first choice, processes those applications. If your child does not get in, then your child is placed on the waiting list for their first choice school, and then the computer says, okay, now we're going to do second choices. Now we're going to do third choices. Do you know the maximum capacity of students that Warren can accommodate so far with the two things? Like, how many people can get in? If it was mainly kindergarten through second, obviously, that's the demand. What do you think the numbers are? The question is about what do you think the numbers are. I think we have to try to address that earlier. We will obviously try to accommodate as many children as we can. The, the, the thing to remember is, of course, it's, it's a very large building. And some people are saying, well, what if I wait? Will I be able to get in? And the answer is, you can apply. If you don't apply to an open enrollment, you can still apply through September 30th. It will depend on the space available. But space available doesn't just mean that there's a, a hallway of rooms. If we have two kindergartens or three kindergartens and they're full, then we have six more students. We're obviously not going to open another kindergarten class. So that's where the, the capacity piece in terms of how many students we can accommodate. What we will be doing which we do with all schools, but we certainly will keep a, you know, we keep a sharp eye on this as a new school. We'll be monitoring the enrollment numbers as we move forward, and um, as we see how those go, then we will structure the number of classrooms and the number of teachers for those particular grades.
she already went into STEM, decided it wasn't right, can she go back? Is that right? Yeah, no. or before the beginning of right. the year. But you said, no, I decided I want to go back, but, it, but you've already been assigned to the STEM school. Yeah, because open enrollment is March 9th, right. so you have to put it in now. So, well, you can put it in later, but you obviously have a better chance of getting in, because the open enrollment application will all get processed first, after that, it's first come to serve for whatever space is available. If you do get assigned to STEM, your child or any other school, your child will use their current assignment. If there is still space available at that school, you can change up until September 30th. Anybody can go to any school that has space up until September 30th, at which point the waiting list moves and changes uh, are concluded for that year. So we figured out a way that we we'll have the question was about twins. What if one gets in and one doesn't? So there's very good detailed questions about questions and answers about twins and siblings that is on the website. Um, but basically there's a way to handle it so that um, if they end up in different schools, there's a way to link them so that they would be either assigned together or on the way. So the question has to do with what about siblings in different grades who aren't twins or triplets or whatever. So the way it works is, and again, I would, if you do have siblings, I would definitely refer you to the enrollment website because there's a lot of very detailed questions about siblings. But basically what will happen is if you tell us that you want those students to go, if you apply for both children to the same schools in the same order, Unless both of them can be assigned, then they will both keep their other assignment. So we would not move one unless they could, unless they could both get in. There, you don't have assignment priority, but you have transportation, which nobody else does. Well, the question is, will children who live in West Seattle get priority over children who live in Greenwood? And I talked about the uh, geographic priority, which we're not kicking in. Um, we did not kick it in the first year for any of the option schools. Um, the, honestly, the likelihood, because you get transportation anywhere within West Seattle, the likelihood of many students with parents having to provide their own transportation, I think we're, I, I do not anticipate many, if any, applicants from other parts of the district. Okay. I need a second. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, only started two days ago. How many spots are left? Well, we haven't designated a set number of spots because we're going to try to adjust the classes to the interest. Well, where we're going to stand right now is we have eight, as of last night, we have 800 applications actually entered in the computer. We have piles of them waiting to be entered. And before all is said and done, we will probably have about 6,000 applicants. So we don't have any meaningful, not for staff, just for Ryan, sorry. Ryan, um, we'll have a hard time accommodating 6,000 students. But, but you don't start assigning schools until everybody has their application in, right? We do not start assigning schools until all the applications that came in during open enrollment, it's all like they came in at the same time. They just get put in the computer. Anything that comes in later, after open enrollment, we don't deal with until we've done the open enrollment process. Thank you.
neighborhood school can absolutely be met in this school. There will be a therapy room built. Um, so speech and language, OGPT, and resource room or, or service model two, yes, can be met in this school. Thank you. 
link to the school and job was at before would depend if there were space in that particular grade. What about beyond that, September 30th, that what happens? After the 30th. The question is what happens after September 30th. After September 30th, basically September 30th, we stop moving kids around so things can settle and move forward, and that's when we do our final staffing and budget adjustments. If there's a serious issue, there is an appeals process that you can go through that request an exception to the rule, so it will depend on the circumstances. If it's enrollment, will you indicate that? And if not, yes. So if we're talking about moving or having the STEM program for middle school being in Madison, uh, so if your assignment area is Denny, and your child is going to K through five STEM, uh, do they have any option of going to the middle school STEM? So good question. The question is, if I have my child in this K five STEM and my middle school assignment is Denny, and the STEM ends up being in Madison, would I have that option? So those are the kinds of things we would be looking at as we move forward with the program development in middle school and high school. We do have pathways for students in language immersion programs, so that is something that can be considered. It's, it's something we're just not up to yet, uh, but we do do that. Um, as she said, the language of version models are all set of precedent for doing something like that. Because Oregon is an inner site and a permanent site is established, 
there will be transportation within all of West Seattle to Oregon and to Pathfinder as there is now. So what this would do is most of the middle school service areas have an option school. There are a few where two schools share one option school. And Pathfinder is one of those, and San Jose in the north part of the district is one of those. So what this would do is we would have then two option schools in West Seattle.
It's a great question. Boeing is very excited about this, by the way. I have a husband at Boeing who's telling me that the majority, or at least half and a few more of his engineers, are retiring in the next five years. And that he's having a harder and harder time finding a pool of applicants. So it's an opportunity. Kim, do you know if in the design team applications there was any businesses? Did you have any more? I haven't looked at them with that kind of depth yet. Okay. So she doesn't know yet. However, we are committed to three community groups on the team. And so we will recruit if we don't get those three. And I have business cards from five different people. You bet. Because then they own it. Right? They're invested. Thank you. And if you know anybody I should be calling, let Kim know. She'll take it down. Um, hello. Over here.
When was it going? I'm so embarrassed. I'm really sorry. I was somewhere before this meeting and I should have grabbed it. But we can put it on the website. Actually, I probably should ask them because they might have just given me the card saying this sounds good and I probably should post it. Um, you see, I'm getting back to second question, so go ahead. Okay, so um, in terms of the curriculum development, when uh, will, will we have a, an ability to view what that looks like? Oh, prior? absolutely. Yeah, and so do you have an ETA or a date that that would be? And then also, I heard you say April for physical facilities. Did, that there'd be an open house? May. May. Okay, so, so the then, question. So the physical facilities will all be done by May? No. 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 So the, thank you. Good question. The question is would parents um, or and interested community members be able to see the curriculum as it's being developed? And the other question was. Will the facility be done in April or May? The facility will not be done probably until the very end of August. Um, but we have never built a open school um, yet. Um, that is under construction. They might be doing some polishing in there while the teachers come back to do their planning those two days before. The materials, typically when, a, when we do a district adoption, we are required to make it available for family input as well as teacher input across the system. So my recommendation um, will be for this group that determines what materials is that during that open house or even before they have those materials available. So for example, if the school chooses to use Singapore math, we would go to the Singapore representative who I met with just a few weeks ago, because I figured out they start learning about this, um, and ask him to give us sample materials which we would then lay out and have it available for you to come and look at we figure out with. We'll be housing the principal in central office right next to Kim um, until we can get her into the office space in, in her building. But my guess is it's going to be August before she can actually get in there and not be at risk of all the, um, the oh, construction okay. workers. Okay, um, let's see. You know, would you go ahead? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, quick question is regarding um, the little financial travel right now. Would parents have to make certain investments, like you buying materials for this new program? And at my kids' school, I'm able to assist sometimes to uh, do parent stations and stuff like that. Would parents be able to come during class to see how things are going or something like that? Excellent. So two questions. One is, will parents be required to make an investment of materials, etc.? We are a public school system, and you cannot. We're required to make an investment of materials, We 
all said, we've got to figure out if there's a place in Seattle schools for Dr. McKinney. She actually has a Washington State Principal for Credential from 2008, so she has been considering a move to Washington State and to Seattle for four years. Um, as soon as we knew we were going to do it in this dam, she has a background in math, science, and technology. She is the principal of the Turner School, so that's a school that was failing. And um, she was brought in to start to literally turn it around, and that's a very hard thing to do, and make changes. She is energetic and enthusiastic. And then if you saw the text I got every morning on my phone meet at 7 a.m. So I am deeply impressed with what she brings as a leader as well as a program. I hope you will be too. Yes, sir. Sue, so, I think there was a question um, in their first meeting that I think it's 28, 29 children to, to a teacher. Are there going to be assistants or is this going to be one teacher for all those kids? So, so contractually right now, by contract, we taught kindergarten through third for next year. For next year. Go ahead. Tracy will do this one. So next year, kindergarten through third grade will be 26. Fourth and fifth will be 28 as a maximum. If there is a multi-age class, it's two less than that. If we end up with one extra child in a third grade class or something of that nature, then the teacher gets paid an additional overload for that. But the staff regulations we're using are 26 and 28. So there's no assistant. There's not a second person in the room. Oh. <laughs> so right now, we do not provide assistance in gen ed classrooms. The assistants that generally are there are either assistants supporting children learning English as a second language or assistants supporting children with special needs. They generally uh, work with all kids in the class and then spend some focused time with the students that they're specifically supporting. So no, we, none of our schools um, have centrally paid for assistance in gen ed classrooms. The only school that has that right now is the school I told you about where there has been a private investor who's invested in the school. My daughter happens to teach in that school. So she teaches kindergarten and has this. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. So Tracy, okay. That's one of the uh, advantages of an option school. Once a child is assigned through school choice to an option school, you can actually move anywhere in the city and still stay there. You won't necessarily get transportation depending on where you move. If you move outside of the district, there's laws, separate laws that apply to that. So how about transportation? Like, um, you know, the school is relatively close to where I live now, but if it moves. Um, to a different part of West Seattle, then I might be in a situation of having to transport my child far away. It will depend on where we end up with any boundary changes, what other new buildings we own in, which attendance area the school, which service area the school is associated with. Um, so. And, and will there be an opportunity for parents to put input in those sort of decisions? Yeah, actually, there are, there's a series of community meetings starting in. It's on the website that is the planning for what's called Mex 4, Building Excellence 4, which is a levy that will be put to the voters next year. And so we're starting uh, community engagement meetings to see what people, what priorities uh, the public would like the, the um, district to pursue.
and because you have a track record that demonstrates that this is something that you'll be capable of. She has been in education, I believe I read, 20 years. Thank you for being here twice. Um, I think the hardest thing, so I was a Seattle Public Schools mom for seven 
educators, as I had told you earlier, and making decisions is really challenging. And there are days when you need to do what's right for your kid, and that's going to be different for every child. And I did all the same stuff when I visited all the schools and had great names. Happy to say, well, my kids go through college and are doing well, and my daughter's teaching. So it does, it does work. Um, some of the drama majors is making a living drama, which is more of <laughs>